So we're looking at passive transport. Now, how do I, how did we identify that? All right. So first of all, when we're looking at the image on our left, we're dealing with a small nonpolar molecule. Okay. And when we're talking about these sort of molecules, they're going to passively diffuse down the phospholipid bilayer. And we're going to move from a concentration uh, of a high concentration to a low concentration, right? So we would be moving down the concentration gradient, right? So for the image on our left, we would be moving from our extracellular matrix into the cytosol or the cytoplasm of our cell. Does passive transport require energy? No, very good. Now, for the image on our left, what type of diffusion is this? Is it simple diffusion or is it facilitated diffusion? Simple, very good. So we're looking at simple diffusion. And when we are saying it's simple, it means no proteins are involved with the transport of the molecules. So no proteins are involved in moving the oxygen across. Oxygen will just diffuse naturally down its concentration gradient. So on the image to our right, we know that this is gonna be facilitative diffusion, right? So where will the water diffuse? From where to where? High to low, right? So exactly from down to top. So from the cytosol of our cell to the extra cell matrix. Okay. And so the reason this is facilitative is you can see I drew a protein here. What protein is the protein involved with the facilitative transport of water? There's a specific name we have for it. Very good. Yes, an aquaporin. So it's important to know the name of this transporter. So we have aquaporins. So when we're talking about facilitative diffusion, there's going to be a protein involved to help aid the transport of certain molecules. These molecules that are transporting could be or they need assistance is because of their polarity, right? So it could be hard for them to go through the phospholipid bilayer because they're a polar molecule or the size, say we have glucose. Um, glucose um, could be maybe a slightly larger molecule or slightly polar. So we need the aid of a protein to help transport. Okay, so that's facilitative diffusion. And again, both of these are passive. So both are gonna be passive. And so they do not require ATP and they go down their concentration gradient. So is everyone good with passive transport? Does anyone have any questions about that? Because next we're gonna move on to active transport. Okay. If you have any questions, do ask. So the next question, all right. So this is gonna be active transport, okay? And we're gonna be looking at our sodium potassium pump, which you guys need to know for the exam. So we're gonna read the paragraph together and there are going to be certain points in the sentence where we have to either circle high or low or increase or decrease. Okay. And then after we go through this, I'll go and explain the active transport again. So let's start reading the paragraph. So when exposed to the cytosol, the pump has what? A high or a low affinity for the sodium sites. Again, the cytosol is the inside of the cell. And outside of the cell is the extracellular matrix. So does the pump have a high or a low affinity for sodium when facing the cytosol or the inside of the cell? Very good. It has a high affinity. Here, let's use green. It has a high affinity for the sodium sites. So when our pump, again, we're talking about the sodium potassium pump, when our pump is facing the inside of our cell, it has a high affinity. The protein, the conformation of the protein has a high affinity for the sodium, which means sodium will be attracted easily to the protein. Okay. So it has a high affinity for the sodium sites and it will have what a high or a low affinity for the potassium sites in that conformation. It does have a high or a low affinity for potassium when it's in the formation facing the inside of the cell. <laughs> 
Very good, low. Okay, so when our potassium, sodium potassium pump is facing towards the inside of our cell, so you can see in the image to our left, it's facing the inside of the cell, the pump has a low affinity for potassium, for potassium, but it has a high affinity for sodium. And this is important, okay? So when three sodium atoms bind to the pump, the pump binds ATP, okay? So once three sodiums have been attracted and have bound to the potassium, sodium potassium pump, now it has, the pump now has an affinity for ATP. So because of the binding of sodium, now there is an affinity for ATP. Is that clear for you guys? When sodium binds to the pump, that binding creates the affinity for ATP. Okay? So now ATP is then broken down to ADP and inorganic phosphate. And this is the phosphorylation. So once ATP binds to the pump, and again, it bound to the pump because sodium bound to the pump, then the ATP breaks down to ADP and inorganic phosphate. And that is the phosphorylation. That is where we are using ATP for energy. Breaking ATP into ADP and inorganic phosphate is where we use it for energy. So this causes the pump to change conformation. And the sodium sites are exposed now. What is the NA site exposed to, the inside or the outside of the cell? After our ATP has attached and then phosphorylated. Is it now facing the inside or the outside of the cell? Very good. It's going to face the outside of our cell. So now there's been a conformation change. This is when we talk about conformation changes of proteins. This is what we're talking about. The sodium potassium pump is now facing the outside of the cell. So now the sodium is going to be facing outside of the cell where the sodium concentration is already high on the outside. Okay, let's continue with our paragraph. So this, what does it do? This increases or does it decrease the affinity of the pump for the sodium sites? We're looking right here. Does it increase or decrease the affinity of the pump for the sodium sites when the pump is now facing the outside of the cell? Very good, it decreases the affinity. So now that our pump is no more facing the inside of our cell, this new conformation, that is facing outside of the cell, no more has an affinity for the sodium, okay? So because of the change in the conformation of the protein, sodium is no more attracted or having affinity to the, pro to the transport protein, right, to our pump, and it decreases the affinity for sodium. And that causes sodium to be released. So sodium is released to the outside where the concentration is what? Sodium is released to the outside where the concentration is high for sodium. Again, this is active transport. So active transport is where we are transporting a molecule against its concentration gradient. So when we're talking about passive transport, the molecule of interest, say let's continue with the oxygen example we had in our previous slide. It had a high concentration over here. So because it had a high concentration, it was able to passively transport to its low concentration, right? But sometimes we don't always want to move down our concentration gradients. Sometimes we need to move against our concentration gradient, but that doesn't happen naturally. To do something that is against something natural, we have to be using our energy, which is ATP. So because sodium is high on the outside of our cell, our goal is to maintain that concentration high outside of the cell. The only way to maintain the high sodium concentration and to prevent it from going down its concentration gradient is to use ATP to push sodium against its concentration gradient to where it is high outside of the cell, to maintain the fact that sodium is high outside of the cell. Does that make sense or do you want me to repeat it again? Okay, good. So again, active transport, we're going against the gradient. So we have to be using energy to make sure we're keeping our pump from pumping sodium towards, like we want our pump to keep pumping sodium against its gradient. So it's going against the natural flow. And that's why we need to use ATP. Okay, so this is where we are in our sentence. All right, I'm moving now here. So now the pump faces the outside, right? Where it has a high affinity for two potassium atoms. When they bind, the inorganic phosphate group is removed resulting in another conformation change. Okay, 
let me reiterate what we just said. So now our pump is facing the outside of our cell, right? The sodium have left, right? We're looking here. These three little orange circles, they left our pump. Now that they left our pump, it has an affinity for potassium. So potassium will now bind to our pump. And remember, our pump had that inorganic phosphate that was added from ATP. But once these two potassiums bind to the pump that has that inorganic phosphate, now that inorganic phosphate loses its affinity for the pump and it goes away. Did you guys understand what I said? So when this blue potassium binds to the pump, this yellow inorganic phosphate is now released. Again, anything that binds to the pump will change this conformation and will have an effect on the affinity. So did you guys get that so far? Okay, so now that the K plus atoms are bound to the potassium or sodium potassium pump and the inorganic phosphate is removed, now there's another conformation change that will, rev will revert it to the original shape it was on the left side, right? So once these potassiums bind, it's going to do another conformation change that will make sure the pump is facing the inside of the cell again. So the potassium atoms are released into the cytosol due to the low binding strength of the pump. So now that our, our pump is now facing back to normal, so look at our left image. So once the potassiums bind, they will flip the pump facing back to the inside of the cell. And so now that the pump is facing the inside of the cell, the potassiums, again, because there's a new conformation, they lose their affinity for the pump. And so the potassium atoms are released into the cytosol due to that low binding strength of the pump, right? And where the K plus concentration is what? High or low? Where is our potassium? Is it in the high concentration or the low concentration? High. Very good. Because our goal is to pump our low potassium to our high potassium area. Okay? And so the pump faces the inside or the outside of the cell again. Where does it face at the end of the cycle? Inside, very good. All right, so now that we're done with that paragraph, I'm gonna say, or would you guys like me to say everything again? Because I can explain the pump again. Do you guys want me to repeat it or are you guys good? Are you guys good with the active transport and sodium potassium pump? Okay. Is, that ever, is everyone else good? I'll assume so. Okay. So goal, okay. So the goal of the sodium potassium pump is just to pump against the concentration gradient. And this works with the conformation changes of the protein, the transport protein. All right, so now let's talk about secondary active transport, all right? So let's talk about what secondary active transport is. So is ATP being used directly or indirectly in our secondary active transport? Indirectly, very good. So let's talk about our, our secondary active transport. So we have two types of secondary active transports, right? We have symport and we have antiport. Now, in this example, both images, I'm gonna be using the example of sodium and glucose. And we're gonna be saying that this transporter is able to transport sodium and glucose, okay? So let's only look at the image on our left for now. Okay, we're looking at symport. What does symport mean? Can someone explain what symport is? Symport means both traveling the same direction. Very good. So symport means that our driving ion and the ion of, and the other molecule of interest are moving in the same direction, okay? That doesn't mean they're moving down their same concentration gradients. Keep that in mind. 
Okay, that's a very important point. Just because they're moving in the same direction does not mean they're moving down the same concentration gradient. Do not assume that's the case. It's actually the exact opposite, okay? And it's important. They're moving in the same direction, but not down their same concentration gradient. Again, this is active transport, right? The goal of active transport is to move a molecule from an area of a low concentration to an area of a high concentration. And the reason it's active transport is because we need energy to do that. We need some form of energy to do that because that is not how it works naturally. Naturally, we move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration, okay? So our driving ion in this situation is gonna be red. It's gonna be sodium, okay? And sodium is gonna be having a high concentration in the outside of our cell, all right? So this outside is on the top and the inside is on the bottom like we've had in all our examples so far. So sodium is gonna move down its concentration gradient naturally, right? Since sodium has a high on the outside of the cell and low on the inside of the cell, this driving ion is gonna be moving down its concentration gradient, okay? So this is gonna be going down its concentration gradient naturally, right? Naturally, you move from high to low. So right here is just something that naturally happens, right? Does there, is everyone clear with the movement of the driving ion? Yes, okay. So there is no, it's, it's essentially like passive transport, okay? It's moving from high to low. But we use that energy from it naturally going from a high to low to pump another molecule against, all right, keyword against its concentration gradient, okay? The concentration gradient would naturally be like this from high to low for our glucose, which is the blue molecule. But in this case, we will be doing the exact opposite of moving down the concentration gradient. We're gonna be moving against the concentration gradient from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. And the only way we were able to do that, the only way we were able to do that is by using the energy of the sodium moving down its concentration gradient, okay? So when sodium moved down its concentration gradient, we we'll use that energy to pump glucose, which was in a low concentration on the outside, to the inside, which is in a high concentration. Is that clear with everyone? And the reason it is called symport is because they moved in the same direction. So does anyone want me to repeat this second part I mentioned? Because this is where it's a little tricky. You have to keep in mind that just because they're moving in the same direction doesn't mean they're moving down the same concentration gradient. As a matter of fact, one moves down its concentration gradient normally, which is our driving ion, and the other molecule will be moving against its concentration gradient. And that's why it's active transport, okay? Now, why is ATP considered indirectly responsible? Okay, let's look at this molecule called sodium, right? Its concentration is what? High or low outside of the cell? Can someone tell me that? Concentration of sodium is high or low? High, very good, right? But why is it high? What maintains that concentration of a high, what maintains sodium's concentration outside of the cell, right? That sodium potassium pump. That sodium potassium pump is responsible for maintaining that high concentration of sodium outside of the cell, okay? And so what is responsible or what molecule is responsible for keeping that sodium concentration high outside of the cell? Well, it's ATP, right? So ATP is responsible for establishing our driving ion concentration gradient. If it weren't for ATP, sodium would not be high outside of the cell. It would have already went inside the cell because it really wanted to go inside of the cell naturally. But that ATP from the sodium potassium pump was making sure that sodium was high outside of the cell. And so that's why ATP is indirectly responsible. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. So now let's look at antiport. The only thing that's changing in antiport is just our directions, right? And antiport, our driving ion, which is again sodium, and our molecule of interest, which is gonna be glucose, they're going in opposite directions, okay? But again, in this situation, 
the two molecules are going in the opposite direction, but their concentration gradients are also in the opposite direction. So the concentration gradient of sodium is going to be going from high to low. Again, this is natural. And we're going to use that energy to pump glucose, which is in a low concentration in the inside, to the outside of the cell. So all that's changed is that the direction has changed, but the concept is the same. We're using the energy of sodium naturally flowing down its concentration gradient to pump glucose, for, which is in a low concentration inside the cell, to the outside of the cell. Okay? And again, ATP is responsible for establishing that driving ion concentration gradient. ATP was responsible for making sure that sodium is high outside of the cell.